घर असावे घरा सारखे नकोट नुसती भिंतीदारे आकांक्षेला पंख फुटावे सहज मोजण्या तारे घर असावे असे असावे घर असावे घराचे स्वप्न साकारणारी माणसं हावरे इंजिनियर्स आणि बिल्डर्स प्रायव्हेट लिमिटेड The situation was extremely difficult. There was a failure in oxygen mass of Ganesh Mure and Anand Mai, and Bhushan Harshe had a head injury. Stormy winds and heavy rainfall continued to pour down. It was getting increasingly difficult to breathe. If all of us would, would have suddenly gone ahead, everybody's life would be in danger. The tallest peak in the world, Mount Everest, was right in front of us. The peak we had aspired to scale for last 12 years was right in front of us, but the time was not right. Yet, we had to turn back. We told the big mountain, we are not going to give up, we will return. But the good news of the expedition was that all the other eight members succeeded in their mission to scale Everest. Prasad Joshi, Tekraj Adhikari, Krishna Dhokle, Rupesh Khopre, Chetan Ketkar, Ashish Mane, Rahul Yelange and Surendra Jalihal reached the peak of Mount Everest. Thus, Giri Premi nailed a mark of success. But success had eluded these four mountaineers who were part of the team. They decided to wholeheartedly take up the challenge again and began planning an expedition. Umesh Jirpe, Bhushan Harshe, Ganesh More and Anand Mali were once again going to attempt climbing Everest while Ashish Mane was going to scale Mount Lhotse. Attempting Everest and Lhotse at the same time was indeed a very ambitious plan. No civilian expedition in India had ever attempted such an operation before. It was a challenge designed to test the mental and physical prowess of the mountaineers. But there was an equally huge obstacle that they had to overcome before beginning the expedition the difficulty in raising funds. Such expeditions involve enormous amounts of money and in a developing country such as India, mountaineering is not yet backed by the state. Thus, Giri Premi had to arrange its own finances for this expedition. But the world once again proved the adage that a good cause always gathers social support. help began to pour in from all sections of society. The support and enthusiasm that showered upon the team inspired them to initiate their preparations with renewed vigor and eagerness. A grand and spectacular function was organized where Brigadier Ashok Abbey flagged off the expedition. 
It was apt that Brigadier Ashok Abbey was asked to do the honours as he was the one who, in 2003, had led India's first successful army expedition to Everest and Lhotse. His cheering provided the necessary fillip that the team badly wanted. In a famous multinational company, I was working as an operations manager. I had an important designation in my office and taking a prolonged leave of 70 days was clearly a major problem. Things boiled down to deciding whether I should leave such a wonderful job or let go of the chance to scale Everest. It was an important decision of life. I finally decided to quit my job and worry about finding a new job later. When our previous expedition was being planned, I told my fiancé to postpone any wedding plans till I return from Everest successfully. But that year I could not scale Everest due to my accident. Now that we had decided to go to Everest again, I wasn't really sure about whether she is going to support me this time. My support was always there, but it was a very difficult decision to make. Very difficult to digest the thought of letting him go on this expedition. And not letting him go meant asking him to give up his dream. But somewhere in my heart, I knew that he would be successful this time and return home safely. And at last, the moment arrived when the team finally took off on the expedition. Friends and family had all gathered to see them off. The team was overwhelmed by the effusive encouragement they received. Everybody was feeling charged up and raring to go. But behind all the smiles lay a nagging doubt. Would they be able to pull it off? The experienced mountaineers who had lost their lives trying to reach the summits of the Himalayan peaks. Apprehension was evident while taking leave of loved ones. There certainly was cause to worry, but it wasn't greater than the self-belief and the overpowering desire and therefore the team was all smiles as it departed. In due course, the team had overcome opposition from family and other emotional upheavals and set off to achieve its ambitious goal. As the train chugged off from the station, everyone shook hands for a final goodbye. Every mountaineer in the world knows that success in the Himalayas depends on the weather. If you haven't done your homework on the weather, even the most advanced technology will not help your expedition succeed. On reaching Delhi, the team first met scientists from the meteorological department and made arrangements for the expedition to get direct access to data provided by the department. In this way, they would get an accurate assessment of the weather conditions at all times. Their next stop was the Indian Mountaineering Foundation. This is the umbrella organization of all mountaineering associations in India. It offers guidance and useful information to all mountaineers. Here they met Mr. Palden Gyacho, who had been part of the successful 2003 expedition to Lhotse. The team gained useful insights from his experiences. What is the magic of this mountain that makes men give up their jobs, their occupations, leave their families and their cozy existence behind and put their lives in grave danger just to reach its peak? What makes the Himalayas so dangerously attractive? The Himalayas are the world's youngest mountains. Geological evidence tells us that there was once an ocean named Tethys where the Himalayas stand today. Millions of years ago, the landmass of the Indian subcontinent, which had started shifting from the south, crashed into the Eurasian plate in the north. This massive collision created the Himalayas. These are the tallest mountains in the world and are therefore perennially covered in snow. the Indian subcontinent continues to push against the Eurasian plate even today. As a result, these peaks continue to grow taller by about a quarter of an inch each year. Mount Everest is the tallest of these mountains and it is the tallest peak above land known to us. Everest is 29,029 feet tall. Known to Nepalese as Sagarmatha, it is also called Chomalugma or the mother goddess by the Tibetans. It is one of the most remote, most difficult and most dangerous ascents in the world. That is why it attracts mountaineers all over the world as they consider it the greatest challenge. The Giri Premi team departed for Kathmandu. 
Nepal's capital Kathmandu is 4,600 feet above sea level. Nesting in the lap of the Himalayas, this country is a haven for mountaineers and tourists from all over the world. The team first paid their respects at the world-renowned Pashupati Nath Temple. The team then met the Indian ambassador to Nepal, Mr. Jayant Prasad. The market at Kathmandu is a favorite with climbers from all over the world. It stocks all the latest mountaineering equipments and features all the biggest brands. The team purchased some special equipment that they needed for the expedition. The team carefully packed all the equipment they had brought from Pune and also the materials they purchased in Kathmandu. This had to be done very meticulously as these bags would not be opened till they reached the base camp. The team then proceeded towards Faklu. I request you start off for Kerung, sir. The team started the trek from Faplu to Lukla. We decided to focus on acclimatization. Usually climbers go from Kathmandu to Lukla to begin their ascent towards base camp. Lukla is situated at 9200 feet above sea level. We had planned to give some more time to acclimatization and therefore decided to start from Faflu, which is at the lower altitude than Lukla, that is, at 7,900 feet. We decided to trek for 15 days from Faflu to base camp. We often hear the term acclimatization while discussing climbing expeditions to the Himalayas. What does this term really mean? Most cities and towns we live in are nearer to the sea level and not really at very high altitudes. At sea level, the air or atmospheric pressure is 100% or equal to one atmosphere. Due to this pressure, every breath we take fills our lungs with vital oxygen. As you can see here, the saturation level of oxygen in the blood is nearly 100%. At this level, called optimum saturation level, as you can see here, the pulse rate is 60 to 80 per minute and the hemoglobin level in blood is 12 to 15 gram per cent. When we ascend to higher altitudes, the air becomes thinner and the oxygen levels in the atmosphere also go down. The body is not used to functioning at such a low atmospheric pressure. When people who are not habituated to these conditions are suddenly transported to such an altitude, they fall seriously ill and may eventually die condition known as altitude sickness. Climbers therefore spend time moving slowly from lower to higher altitudes in order to acclimatize themselves to these conditions. The trek from Faplu to Lukla would take five days. This area is far away from urbanization and the lifestyle and culture of these people is certainly very different from the hustle and bustle of a city.
The trek was more tiring than expected. This was because we had descended from nearly 10,000 feet to 4,000 feet above sea level and were now ascending to more or less the same altitude. Our feet started to give away and we were not even walking properly. Even the Sherpas who accompanied us were limping. We thought we have made a wrong decision. Though their legs hurt, they continued their trek till they reached the village of Manjo. There is a check post here where every climber must register. Everybody's permits are checked here. From here, one goes to Namche Bazaar. In this difficult terrain, you find several hanging bridges. These simple suspension bridges are a hallmark of this region. Prayer flags are another unique feature of this mountainous region. These are pieces of cloth on which prayers are written. Each cloth is then strung in such a way that it flutters in the wind. The wind is believed to be the bridge or the messenger between humans and God. The number of times your flag flutters in the wind directly represents the number of times your prayer has reached God. The trekkers have now reached Namche Bazaar. The team had now trekked for nine days and had reached an altitude of 11,320 feet. Namche Bazaar is a famous marketplace in the region. The team left Namche Bazaar and reached Tengboche. There is an airstrip made from rock soil at Siangboche nearby. Some climbers land and start their trek directly from here. The team now proceeds to Kunjumkunde. They sighted the Monal, the beautiful national bird of Nepal on the way. The team finally had their first view of Mount Everest and Lhotse. We devoted a lot of time for height gaining. We would climb to 17 to 18,000 feet and descend back to 10,000 feet to spend the night. We were stringently following the golden rule of acclimatization, which is climb high, sleep low. But this had made life unbearable for us. We were eagerly waiting for the day when we would reach base camp. The team now reached the village of Pangboche. They paid their respect to the Lama of the monastery and received his blessings for the expedition. The lifestyle of the mountain folks is very harsh and demanding. They are quite attached to nature and the deities that are closely associated with nature. As we leave urbanization behind and venture towards remote areas, we naturally tend to feel stressed and insecure. Even we were also experiencing that stress. In such circumstances, the local beliefs offer some solace and we begin to feel that there is some superpower watching over us and protecting us. The team resumed their journey with a newfound enthusiasm. The imposing and isolated peak of Amadablam lay before them. 
This is considered one of the most difficult and most dangerous summits in the world. The ceaselessly flowing waters of the Kumbu appeared before them. The waters of this river replenished the entire valley. The team continued its trek along the course of this river. The team has now reached the village of Dingboche. Scaling the Nagarjuna mountain here will be part of the height gaining exercise. Besides, this mountain also offers an astonishing view of the Amadablam peak. This is the Thukla Pass. Here you will find several neatly arranged stones. These are the graves of several mountaineers and Sherpas who didn't make it. The mood becomes somber by seeing these graves. We begin to wonder whether we would make it when the Sherpas couldn't. Sherpas are very strong and resilient folks. More importantly, they belong to this region. If this could happen to them, it could happen to any one of us. But the sight of the majestic mountains would drive away our despair. But we sure were more careful than ever before. Another speciality of the Himalayas is that they never let the thought of impending death go away. The team was slowly approaching Gorakshep. The team was now entering snow-clad regions. The Giri Premi expedition of 2012 had erected a statue of Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj here. They now had the opportunity to meet the inhabitants of this village once again. Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj ki jai! jai. Now the terrain becomes furrowed and fallow with rough hewn and rocky passes and a snowy landscape. We have left human habitation behind. The mountains that appear tiny from far appear so huge from this point that it is impossible to accommodate all of them in a single glance. We can see the Kumbu glacier at a distance, but where we stand it is a river noisily flowing through the mountains. 16 days after they had left Faplu, trekking 100 kilometers and ascending from 5,000 feet to 18,000 feet, the team finally reaches the base camp of Mount Everest. The Sherpa team affectionately welcomed us. We now had to spend 50 days here and had to get used to these surroundings. The view of the Himalayas from the base camp is simply majestic and in a way justifies why the Himalayas are called the rooftop of the world. Any new expedition starts with prayers. Mount Everest is sacred to the Sherpas. They believe that the gods reside here. Climbers from all over the world are seen faithfully participating in the elaborate puja or prayer ritual that lasts at least two and a half hours. The puja is performed to the tune of ima instruments and mantra chants. Amusingly, the offerings to the gods include Coca-Cola bottles, beer and even the local wine, Rakshi. <laughs> we awoke to our first morning in the lap of Mount Everest. Our first task was to set up the communication tower. The next was to conduct a thorough inspection of all our equipment. At the base camp, at height of 17,500 feet, the atmospheric pressure drops to 60% and the oxygen in our blood drops to about 80%.
the air is thinner and that makes it harder to get oxygen. The lungs are now working at full capacity to absorb oxygen. The body struggles to maintain its oxygen saturation. The hemoglobin level increases and the pulse rate goes up to 100 per minute. If you look at these changes happening to our body, you realize why walking a few steps leaves you breathless under these conditions. Today, the team was going to conduct its first exercise on the Khumbu Glacier. From here on, our path was fraught with uncertainty. This extremely picturesque place was going to reveal its treacherous face to them. The team attached crampons to their shoes to help them walk through the deadly ice. In these conditions, even a little effort leaves you breathless and we had to ascend up to 29,000 feet. It is humanly impossible to undertake this all at once. You have to prepare your mind and body for this strenuous task, which is why we have to build up this routine from going base camp to camp 3, which is at the height of 23,000 feet and return back to base camp. We need to undertake this routine at least 3 to 4 times. The team trekked toward the Khumbu Ice Fall. Though it may seem unassuming and harmless, the Khumbu Icefall is actually a death trap. This glacier has claimed the lives of many climbers. A glacier is actually a frozen river. Huge crevasses develop in this giant body of sheer ice. Experienced members of the Sherpa team mark out the path that the others must use to cross this ice sheet. This is called root opening. These crevices are large and deep and must be crossed using ladders that serve as bridges. Sherpas are so specialized in their knowledge and experience on the icy surface and the conditions that they are called ice fall doctors. An approximately safe area is identified to lay the ladder bridge. Then, the ladder is fixed into the ice using special screws called pitons. The first person to cross this ladder is certainly at the highest risk. Crossing a crevice that is hundreds of feet deep is definitely a hazardous task. Of course, the first person is always connected to the next person by a rope. Therefore, the first climber's life is literally in the second climber's hands. moving through an icy wasteland and difficult routes and enduring an exhausting ascent after braving unbearable winds and sparse air the giri premi team reached camp 1 kumbh ice fall is really a tough challenge you look anywhere and you just see zigzags of ice all crevasses 500 feet deep and uh, most of the crevices are hidden. Uh, the ladders, uh, you are not sure whether this ladder will hold your weight or not, and you have to cross it. The team started early next morning for Camp 2. The climate of the Himalayas is very absurd. The mornings are extremely cold with temperatures as low as minus 20 degrees Celsius.
In the afternoon, with the sun towering over us, the temperature rises to 35 degrees. We want to throw away all our warm clothes. With icy cold climate on one hand and the blazing sun on the other, we have to keep moving through these paradoxical conditions. Every moment seems to test our courage. As the ascent reaches greater heights, the pace decreases and walking becomes laborious. The team has now reached Camp 2. They now have to pitch their own tents. This specially designed tent is the creation of Mufaddal Lokhandwala, another climber from Pune. The team witnessed the amazing play of sunlight in the Himalayan ranges and is able to capture the various unique shades of Mount Lhotse. The third day dawned with bright sunshine and the team started towards Camp 3. The plan was to stay at Camp 3 and then return to base camp. But when the team reached the point called Mount Lhotse Face, the climate changed suddenly. The team now understood why the Himalayan climate is called whimsical. The raging winds and heavy snowfall that suddenly erupted made it impossible to go further. The experienced Sherpa team studied the situation and decided that all of us should turn back. The team returned to their tents at Camp 2 to stay protected against the stormy weather and to wait till the storm abated. Everest had given a glimpse of its whimsical side. When the storm had slowly ceased, the team started back toward base camp. The storm had wreaked havoc at Camp 1, making it difficult to stay there. Now the team had to descend with extreme care, even though we were tired. The pace during descent is naturally faster and this may lead to situations where one may slip or the feet may get entangled in one another due to the crampons. One has to be careful about every step that one takes as a single step may send you crashing to your death. The team exercised extreme caution and safely reached base camp. As decided, the team made four trips to Camp 3 and back to base camp. Climbing the Himalayas successfully requires certain physical vigor and mental grit, but it also requires favorable climatic conditions. Many a time, climbers have to patiently wait for the appropriate weather window required to proceed. Currently, the weather is certainly bad. There is snow everywhere. The mood at the base camp is gloomy and disappointing. 
everybody is back to their tents. But a day dawns when all disappointment gets driven away. The team had a surprise visitor, Reinhold Messner. Messner is idolized by mountaineers all over the world and ranks foremost among all living mountaineers today. He has scaled the 14 8,000ers or all the peaks above 8,000 meters in height, becoming the first climber to achieve this height without oxygen. He discussed the expedition at length with the team and offered valuable advice. And at last, the day to scale the summit of Everest dawned. The team received the news that conditions were conducive for the final ascent to the summit. The meteorological department had given the green signal. The team also consulted climbers from other countries who had camped there and prepared themselves for the final phase. Umesh Jirpe, the leader of the expedition, explicitly explained the plan to everybody. The experienced Sherpas also added their words of caution. I've been there many, I mean, I mean, five times I've been up there, and I took that experience between that split. That's I'm going to share it to all of you guys. This is a phase of indescribable mental turmoil. At one end, you have tremendous eagerness, and on the other, there is a fear and apprehension that anything untoward can happen. Even if you are not an emotional person, you would still require some emotional support. <laughs> Base camp manager Ajit Tate gave his best wishes to everybody in the team. All those who would ascend to Everest as well as go to Lhotse were to maintain contact with him. The sky above was littered with stars and ahead of us stood the imposing Mount Everest. The amazing spectacle increased our zeal. The Giri Premi team readied itself for the ultimate assault on Everest and Lhotse. The team started from base camp at 3 a.m. on the 13th of May 2013. To the Sherpas, these peaks are sacrosanct and their reverence is reflected in many of their actions. The team therefore once again started with a prayer to the Mother Goddess. The team started out in the darkness of the night with only the light attached to their headgear and the ropes that they held for assistance. Daylight appeared after the team had climbed for about two and a half hours, giving everybody a great sense of relief. But the team was now once again on the dangerous patch of the Kumbu Ice Fall and they now knew that their familiarity with its conditions cannot make them reckless. It actually makes the team more cautious. They have to be even more alert and ready for the boulders of ice scattered over the surface which may slip and come hurtling toward them at any time. Crossing the unfathomably deep crevices once again sends a shudder down their spines. The Sherpas place prayer flags over the most dangerous places. These also serve as indicators to other climbers of the precariousness of those marked areas.
the team successfully completed crossing through this stringent phase and was on schedule when they reached Camp 1. The team reached Camp 1, which was at a height of 19,193 feet at 8 in the morning. The team decided to take advantage of the fine weather and start ascending further without any delay. The team remembered that their previous expedition had encountered an avalanche at this point. They now had to once again cross a series of crevices, some of which were more than 30 feet wide. Losing your balance or making any small mistake would undoubtedly cost you your life. The team encountered and crossed 35 of these life-threatening crevices. The pace had now slackened. As the sun rose in the sky, it became uncomfortably warm. Sweating can also be fatal as it may not evaporate but freeze when the temperatures drop and this frozen covering may make you susceptible to dangerous frostbite. The team reached Camp 2, which was at a height of 21,000 feet at around 1 in the afternoon. Before retiring for the night, everybody's oxygen saturation was recorded using a pulse oximeter. The team started the next morning toward Camp 3. The Lhotse face now came into view. The entire region was eerily silent, save for the sounds of their feet sinking into the ice below and their breathing. There were no other signs of life anywhere. Here, the body tires and breathing becomes difficult. The bright sunlight illuminates the eyes sharply and this reflection may hurt your eyes and make you permanently blind. Special glasses are used to protect against snow blindness. Now the steep climb starts. This is a vertical climb over a steep incline of 60 to 65 degrees. For climbers, their ropes are their only saviors as any slip from here would mean a sheer fall of several thousand feet. This is a vast glacial valley that is closed on three sides and is called Western Coom. The team once again got a taste of the unpredictable Himalayan weather when suddenly a thick mist enveloped the area reducing visibility to zero. Fortunately this mist soon faded away and there appeared the same bright sunshine as before. Now the climbs are longer and steeper. Even a single step requires a tremendous effort. With the chest heaving heavily, the climbers couldn't take even a step further. At an elevation of 23,000 feet, the atmospheric pressure drops to only 45% and the oxygen in blood drops to only 70%. Due to this, the lungs have to use excess capacity and the pulse rate now goes above 100 per minute. 
At this altitude, the chemical changes in the body affect the mental balance of the climbers. And may also cloud their decision-making capabilities. Unexpected events start happening here. Some climbers get delusional and may have even hallucinations. During practice sessions, I always felt pain in my chest. When I reached base camp, I conveyed this to the doctor there. He examined me and found no problem with my system. But I told him, I am feeling pain. The doctor plainly asked me whether I wanted to go to the top of the Everest or not. I replied, I wanted to reach the summit. He then told me, walk briskly 4 kilometers downhill to Gorakshep and walk briskly back to base camp. He said that if there was any problem with my heart, I would collapse there and there itself. However, if I could accomplish this task, then there was no problem and that I could easily go to the summit. I accomplished the feat in quick time. When I came back and met the doctor, he merely smiled. He later told me that more than half of such problems are purely delusional. At this altitude, there is absolutely no sign of life anywhere and the body's energy reserves are drained to the point where it is sheer human endurance and the will to survive that pulls you through these extreme conditions. Now Camp 3 was just a few steps away. Those who had reached ahead of us welcomed the rest. Everybody had their share of much needed rest and refreshments for their tired bodies. On the 14th of May 2013, at 3 in the afternoon, the team reached Camp 3, which was at an elevation of 23,625 feet. They spent the night here and once again tested their pulse and oxygen saturation before retiring for the night. At night, the temperature fell to minus 25 degrees and stormy winds began to lash the region again and the team had to spend the night at Camp 3 in these testing conditions. The air became extremely sparse from here on. Oxygen masks are required. The team readied itself after putting on the oxygen masks and set out for Camp 4 at 6 a.m. On the way, the team encountered the tattered remains of an earlier expedition's camp that had been destroyed by an avalanche. It was certainly a frightful sight. The journey became more laborious from here on. To add to the team's woes, swirling winds and heavy snowfall continued to confront them. It had become dreadfully cold. The team could barely stay upright in the gushing wind. It was certainly not possible to overtake anybody. Therefore, if one person stopped, everybody had to halt too. Climbers are heavily dependent on the pitons that remain rooted in the ice. These pitons have the capacity to withstand jerks of up to 2,000 kilograms. The double onslaught of the wind and the snow had now become unbearable. could now see the legendary yellow band right ahead of them. The yellow band is a yellowish-brown mass of sedimentary rock, mainly made up of marble, phyllite, and semi-schist sediments. Climbing up the yellow band is a very arduous ascent as the slope at 70 to 80 degrees is now almost vertical and the crampons used to dig into the snow would constantly slip over the surface.
team had reached the point where the routes to Everest and Lhotse diverged. Ashish Mane and two Sherpas segregated from here and moved towards Lhotse. One has to traverse through very rocky terrain before one reaches Lhotse. One has to pass through a long fissure or vertical crevice that extends right up to the summit. This is called the Lhotse Kula. One has to ascend this steep gradient corridor in order to reach the summit of Lhotse. It was planned that Ashish would reach the base of the coolers and camp there and start early either at night or in the wee hours of the morning toward the summit. At an elevation of 8,516 meters, Lhotse is the world's fourth highest peak and certainly one of the most difficult to ascend. Ashish Mane along with Lakpa and Pasang Sherpa were now going to take on the challenge of scaling Lhotse. The rest of the team continued their ascent to the summit of Mount Everest. After a while, they reached the Geneva Spur. This is a rocky area covered with snow. It was named the Geneva Spur by the 1952 Swiss expedition to this area. Behind them stood the face of Mount Everest. One can view Camp 2 in the valley. The team had now made steady progress and reached Camp 4. From base camp to Camp 4 is actually an ascent from 17,500 feet to 26,000 feet. From here, the final ascents to both peaks begin. Here the winds rage at a speed of 80 to 100 kilometers per hour. This not only hampered their movement, but also made it difficult to converse with each other. Just, just reached South Pole. 2.30 I reached at South Pole. It was tremendous wind right from Geneva Spur. Right now also you can see there's a lot of lot of wind. It is it is really difficult to survive outside in this wind. Our Sherpas are really great and they pitch this tent. At this altitude, even thinking coherently was challenging and would indeed test whether you are mentally capable and prepared for the journey ahead. Their plans for an early ascent from Camp 4 were literally swept away by the stormy weather. So tormenting was the wind that no one could venture out from their tents. Even the climbers endowed with the strongest of minds and the greatest team spirit found it difficult to exactly recall the occupants of each tent. There was no other safer alternative for the team other than staying at Camp 4 for the night. Ajit Tate waited at the base camp while friends and family waited anxiously at the Giri Premi office for any news from their loved ones. Terrifying wind gushed throughout the night. My tent fluttered so terribly that I was afraid it might tear down. The wind made frightening sounds and I feared that I might not come out of this ordeal alive. I kept telling myself to keep calm and not to lose hope. We had seen films of famous people who had scaled Everest. We even had met some of these people. Their words now seem to be true. They mentioned that more than the physical endurance, it's your mental strength that determines your success. Due to the winds, we had to stay in our tents that night. And it was doubtful whether we could move ahead the next day too. We began to apprehend that we might have to turn back again after coming so close to the summit. Moreover, we were certainly not prepared for the twist that was going to hit us after that night. We realized that if the stormy weather did not subside, then the number of oxygen cylinders we had would be insufficient to support all of us. After carefully accounting for everything, I concluded that two of us must return back so that there was enough oxygen for the rest of the team to reach the summit. 
had decided me along with Rinji Sherpa would return. It was very difficult decision to make especially when the summit was literally just a few feet away. It was very painful decision. Throughout the night, I was in tears. I had to give up the dream that I had worked so hard for so many years to achieve. But I chose myself because the other team members were younger than me and therefore stood a better chance. But more importantly, it was imperative that everyone returns home safely. And that was my responsibility. As a team leader, I had to decide who from the team was most fit to move ahead on the last leg of the journey. He had organized this expedition and we wouldn't have come this far without his leadership. It was very disappointing that he was leaving and it was indeed very difficult for us to go on without him. A very tough decision for a leader to make. But in the team's interest, Umesh Jirpe left the others and descended back toward base camp along with a member of the Sherpa team. Everest laying in their background and Mount Pomori in the clouds stared at the climbers. Everybody felt extremely disappointed and unenthusiastic. However, a news flash changed all that and renewed their urge to make that final push required to complete their journey to the summit. Ashish Mane had made a solo ascent to the summit and had conquered Mount Yangtze. Ashish started his ascent at about 2 in the morning and reached the other end of the Lhotse coolers by 5 in the morning. The last portion of the coolers was the most difficult to ascend. It was a very steep climb and technically very tough for any climber to execute. But Ashish Mane overcame all difficulties and reached the summit of Mount Lhotse at 7.30 in the morning. team at base camp and those gathered at the Giri Premi office in Pune erupted in joy on receiving the news of this achievement. At camp 4, however, the Sherpa team had begun praying to invoke the weather guards and request them to abate the stormy winds. The faithful have a distinct advantage in these conditions. They have the satisfying relief of assuming that there is someone who will pull them out of these difficulties, someone who is always looking after them. After 12 hours, the stormy weather appeared to subside a little. The team decided to take advantage of this small window of calm and resume their ascent in the dark of the night as they had very little time to lose. Using the torches on their heads, they started off in the pitch darkness of the night toward their final goal. There was no other option but to move ahead and find their way through the darkness, the wind and the heavy snow. It was a tough night. Taking major steps, we moved ahead. We were aware that anything could happen. Anything might come hurtling down on us. We could fall into a hidden crevice. We could observe many international climbers turning back and abandoning their ascent. This sight affected our confidence. Even the Sherpa team accompanying us seemed shaken, but nobody spoke out. All of us kept pushing ourselves and mutely continued our ascent. At 3.30 in the morning, sunlight started appearing on the horizon. And perhaps, for the first time in our lives, we realized the value of light and difference that it makes. The wind continued to hit us, but we started talking and smiling again. 
The snowstorm seemed ceaseless. A layer of snow had settled down on the clothes of the team members. At dawn, the team reached the area called the balcony. From here, one can view the triangular shadow that Everest casts over the Nepalese countryside. The team now used nets and slowly moved ahead. As the force of the wind was so strong that every step was a laborious effort. 18 hours of bad weather had disrupted communications. Base camp and the Giri Premi office in Pune were anxiously waiting for news and every moment of silence was making the situation even more grim. On the other hand, the team was risking everything to resolutely move ahead. An imposingly steep rocky cliff now stood in their way. The crampons on their feet caused them to slip on the smooth rock. The warm clothing did protect the climbers from the biting cold, but severely hampered their movements. They could only lift their feet at a specific angle and could not freely maneuver themselves. They had to literally struggle to make every move. This area between Camp 4 and the summit is called the Death Zone. At 26,500 feet, the atmospheric pressure here is just 40% and the oxygen saturation in the blood has dropped to 60%. It is impossible for normal humans to live without bottled oxygen in these conditions. And even with the help of oxygen, you have only a few hours to reach your goal, as the human body cannot survive for long in these conditions. The team has now reached the famous Hillary Step. Named after Sir Edmund Hillary, who first successfully scaled Mount Everest, this is one of the most dangerous parts of the final ascent. The climbers were exhausted, but risking all they had for this last test. With snow on one side and a sheer cliff on the other, this is one of the most challenging points in the ascent. Meanwhile, Umesh Jirpe and Ashish Mane met at the camp. Both had descended rocky, steep valleys to finally meet each other. Now everybody was eagerly awaiting news from the Everest team. Now the summit of Mount Everest came into view. They could see prayer flags fluttering in the wind and the view that they had till now seen only in pictures. Their spirits knew no bounds, but they continued with caution and patience. And at last, the moment arrived. Bemba Sherpa congratulated all of them when they finally achieved the fruitful culmination of years of labor and resolute effort on the 17th of May 2013 at 6.45 in the morning, Bhushan Harshe, Anand Mai and Ganesh More, all three of them had successfully reached the summit of Mount Everest and unfurled the Indian tricolor there.
the view from the highest mountain in the world was staggering and astoundingly beautiful. They had always looked up to the mountains, but for the first time in their lives, the team could now see Mount Makalu, Mount Lotse and Mount Choyu below them. The dream of Sagarmatha Chomalugma Everest had finally come true.